You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. This is the second in the series of interviews with the authors of the Great War Group introduction series of books. This time I was joined by Chris Sams to discuss his book, Early Cruiser Warfare. It covers most of the early cruiser actions around the world, with the events of Von Spee's squadron and the Emden playing large parts of that story. In the lead-up to the war, there were serious concerns in the Royal Navy about enemy surface raiders, which would attack the trade routes around the world as soon as the war began. There were certain German ships stationed around the world that had the ability to do this, and much of the concern of the Grand Fleet in the North Sea revolved around preventing a larger breakout of enemy ships into the Atlantic. When the war started, these concerns would prove to be legitimate, if maybe a bit exaggerated. We discussed the adventures of Admiral Maximilian von Spee way back in episode 48, and he would take the East Asia squadron comprised of the Scharnhorst, Gneisenau, Leipzig, and Nuremberg on a fantastic voyage across the entire length of the Pacific. They would be met off the west coast of South America by a force of Royal Navy ships, and in the Battle of the Cornell that followed, the German ships would be victorious. Von Spee had a problem, though. His goal was to try and get back to Europe, and this meant that no matter what happened, he would almost certainly be attacked by the Royal Navy on that route home. This would then occur at the Battle of the Falkland Islands, which would see all of the German ships sank by the far superior British forces, including two battlecruisers. One ship that was initially part of the East Asia Squadron that did not make the trip across the Pacific was the Emden, which would move into the Indian Ocean to begin a raiding expedition that would last from August 14th to November 9th, 1914. The story of the Emden its exploits, and its eventual destruction would be front-page news all over the world during the two months that it evaded the Royal Navy's attempts to contain it. This publicity was, honestly, probably far in excess of the actual impact that the cruiser would have on the course of the war, but I think it is, under, it is understandable why it was such a popular story, given how easy it was to kind of understand what was happening with the Emden and what it was doing. While at the same time, the events in Europe were just a confusing mix of place names many people around the world had never heard of. After the end of the Emden's spree in the Indian Ocean, most of the cruiser warfare would be at an end for the rest of the war, simply due to the fact that the resources that the German Navy had at war were exhausted. If you would like to learn far more about the experiences of cruisers during the early part of the war, check out Chris Sams' book with the link in the episode description, or just head on over to greatwargroup.com. Hello everyone and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. Today I'm joined by Chris Sams, the author of Early Cruiser Warfare one of the Great War Group's introduction books that are coming out soon-ish, or they could already be out by the time this, this is released. The release date seems a, a little fuzzy. Uh, Chris Sams, welcome uh, to the interview, and thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Okay, so you, you wrote a book about early cruiser warfare um, in the First World War. What has drawn you to this topic? What made you want to write a book about it? Um, well, uh, <laughs> it's not as an interesting way. Um, I worked um, at the Imperial War Museum in the security department, and that would often mean getting up really early to go to work. Um, so catching the train at like four o'clock in the morning. And I was reading through Wikipedia 
and it you know they give you the um uh, subjects you might be interested in and it had uh, it came up with the emden um you know 4 30 in the morning sitting in a train tunnel like yeah i'll read that and then i went from there on to von spey the falklands coronel into everything else um and then we had the centenaries and so i started to try and live blog um or at least get the anniversaries for like all the battles and what everyone was doing and then um i ended up writing a book about it in 2015 um uh, on because i'd written all these blogs and i just thought oh, i wonder if i can um someone was trolling um trawling through facebook looking for authors and they said, oh, we're trying to get someone in the Second World War. I said, what about First World War early cruisers? And they went, send us a proposal. And so I did that. And, yeah, I've kind of got stuck with them. I can't, I, I, um, it's, it's become my happy place. <laughs> I, uh, I definitely feel like there's a whole generation of historians. A lot of them are probably still younger at this point that sort of had their, their sort of Genesis light bulb moment randomly reading on Wikipedia at some point. <laughs> and that's what got their ball going absolutely kind of hooks you and then you just find yourself going oh that's interesting and you disappear down a rabbit hole following all the links and things and uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic um so so when we're looking at, at cruiser warfare specifically at cruiser warfare sort of in the years before the first world war uh, how did the german imperial navy think that they were going to use these cruisers that they had um and did they have any kind of concrete plans of, about what would happen? Or were they just sort of broad commerce rating guidelines? We'll see how it goes. I think, I think it's probably more the latter. I mean, for, um, I, I, I don't think anyone really thought that they would be fighting everyone at once in Europe in 1914. Um, but for the Germans, the biggest, um, biggest uh, enemy was going to be the Royal Navy. So they had to maintain the balance in the North Sea, which meant that all the all the good capital ships, like the the um, battle cruisers and battleships, were going to be in um, in the North Sea. There's no two ways about it; they had to be there. Um, but in they also needed ships out in Asia, uh, for, in Tsingtao, and uh, for policing the uh, imperial holdings or the islands. And again, um, Dar es Salaam in Africa, East Africa. That was mainly, I think that was mainly to annoy the British after the Boer War, um, because they, Germany tried to hint, uh, rattle the sabre during the Boer War, but the um, solitary um, gun, um, unprotected cruiser was massively outclassed by all the British ships that turned up. So having, having Königsberg there, was a, it was a step up. Um, they knew when, Britain, when they were going to be at war with Britain that the ships in the East, on the East Asian squadron or, and the um, Africa, African squadrons weren't going to be enough to defeat, um, to win a campaign. Britain outnumbered them, Britain outgunned them. So the idea of commerce raiding was basically um, it was hedging your bets in a way. If you can take your guns off and put them on civilian ships, you can do more damage over a larger area. And um, so it was hoped that they would try and do as much damage as possible. And with the Schlieffen plan, ultimately the war was going to be over by Christmas. So all, all von Spee would have to do was hold in in the Austasian Gishvada would, would be to hold out till Christmas. So I think it was kind of hoped if we, if we do as much damage as possible and hopefully our boys will come home at the end of it. If not, we can cause the British, if it can force the British to bleed ships off from the North Sea, that will give us then the advantage in that bit. And then we can hit them in the big um, naval battle that never came. <laughs> um, so, so they have these kind of ships and these far flung squadrons. Can what are some of the like basic characteristics of the cruisers in these squadrons? Uh, um, you know, uh, what kind of guns do they have? What is their, you know, range and things like that? Uh, mostly, mostly the light cruisers were. Um, so in the East Asian squadron, that'd be the Emden, Leipzig, Nuremberg and Königsberg, which was Nuremberg's sister uh, off Africa. Um, they uh, were armed mostly with. Um, uh, ten inch, not ten inch guns. That'd be hilariously. Dumb. What am I saying? Ten centimeter guns. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, which um, and they were they had a rough speed of about uh, about, uh, about twenty knots. Um, but for the the main the biggest ships abroad, not including the one in the Mediterranean, 
but uh, in Asia would be the Shan Horse class uh, armored cruisers. So they had eight 8.3 inch guns, six 5.9 inch guns, 18 3.5 inch guns, four torpedo tubes, and um, had a top speed of around 22.5 knots, which made them um, fairly big fish in that small pond. But the British had the Australia, which was the uh, battle cruiser, um, which could single handedly take out Von Space Squadron on its own at range. Um, they also had two pre dreadnought battleships, which use that people say the term pre dreadnought, they think old and um, rubbish. They, they hadn't been, they weren't that old and they had a massive amount of firepower. And against a dreadnought, they wouldn't do too well, but against two armored cruisers and some light cruisers. So Britain had the Triumph and the Swiftshore um, nearby as well. So the, the Germans were outgunned. Um, but the light cruisers had, gave speed and range as well to the squadron. So it was quite a decent mix. The Mediterranean squadron, which I won't talk about too much, um, is, uh, had the battle cruiser Goban. Uh, which was a huge problem for the British um, and the light cruiser Breslau. Um, um, the Goban, it, like the Australia, could take out a, a, a British fleet that didn't have battle cruisers on its own at range and keep sailing around them um, so they couldn't be caught, couldn't get into torpedo range and just take them apart. I think it's interesting that you mentioned the the like comparisons between uh, free dreadnoughts and dreadnoughts during this period. Because it's not like there's a long period. It's like one year they're making free dreadnoughts, that two years later it's all dreadnoughts. And so there's a there's not a there's a lot of ships out there in the world at this time that are of the pre dreadnought vintage. And so, you know, having a couple or, or describing something like that doesn't mean it is totally useless. Oh, absolutely. And and you've also get like the um the Deutschland class pre dreadnoughts coming out after dreadnought had been completed. And in England, the Lord Nelsons they were still being built when Dreadnought was built. So that ultimately, as soon as they rolled, rolled into the sea, they were um, obsolete, <laughs> which is a bit crazy. So they're often referred to as semi-Dreadnoughts to uh, kind of appease people. Yeah. You didn't totally waste your money. You just mostly wasted your money. Yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> so um, we talked about a little bit about the, the German ships here, but let's let's look at the British. So the British had to know that this was kind of going to happen in some way. So what was kind of their plan to combat surface raiders j- just in general, like the cruisers that we're looking at here? Um, well, um, Britain tried to solve the situation to, to crack the nut with a sledgehammer in a way that, and it, they tried to flood as many ships as possible to try and catch these raiders as quickly as possible. Um, in Asia, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Churchill at all in this period, or at all. And he, um, but in, uh, I've said this before in a previous interview, that with the, um, he, he's playing chess, so he can see where all his ships are. He doesn't necessarily know where the Germans are, but he's able, he can see the bigger picture. Whereas the admirals on the ground can only see what they're doing. Um, and in Asia, you get um, the, the Australian government are trying to control Admiral Patey's squadron. And Admiral Jerome decides to set off quickly before Churchill can give him some orders. And their, their idea is if we can get rid of the German bases, we, or, um, or if we can catch the German fleet at sea, we can destroy it, get it done, all done, and then we can take the islands um, and all the safe havens, etc., at our leisure. Whereas um, the Australians decide, well, let's just take the ports. Let's get rid of their ports and their safe havens now. Off the coast of Southern America, you can't take the ports because um, they're neutral countries. Um, so it's just a matter of having British ships cruising up and down, looking for possible safe havens and hope and listening for wireless chatter. Um, because although wireless is great and you can send messages to loads of people, uh, to other ships and organize, um, meetings and stuff with supply ships, you can also try and someone else can hear you triangulate your position, work out where you are and then turn up, um, which happened to the Carlsru, um, when she stopped a, uh, she stopped a British ship. A liner went past and signaled. It was a Spanish liner went past and signaled them and said, um, "What's going on here?" And they said, "Oh, we're a we're a, we're a British ship. We're doing a routine inspection." And the Spanish liner said, "Oh, okay, no problem." And HMS Canopus, that was further away, another pre dreadnought, sent a signal saying, "What's going on?" They said, "Oh, there's a British ship." And they said, "Which one?" And the Carlsru went, "Oh, crap!" So they quickly sank the British ship and sailed away. And by the and car, um, when the by the time the battleship got there, there was no one there. But that that was an example of where wireless goes wrong. 
so, so I'm assuming uh, they also had to use wireless to coordinate, uh, you know, supplies. They are, these are coal-fired ships, and I'm assuming they did not carry enough coal to go all the way across the Pacific like they would end up doing uh, in the case of the Von Spee squadron. Well, um, Von Spee actually did. Um, he, um, right at the beginning, because he was quite, his Scharnhorst and Neisnau were already out of Singtao port. They were already on a um, flying the flag mission. And um, so they sent a signal saying all German ships, colliers and whatever, meet us at um, this island whose name I suddenly can't remember. I keep getting them muddled up sometimes. Um, but he, he, he called all German ships to him and as many colliers as possible. And they loaded, they actually stacked the decks of the cruise, of the armor cruisers and the light cruisers with as much coal as they could, as well as what was in the uh, coal supply and the coal bunkers. And then they had colliers as well. The problem for Von Spey was they then got caught in a tropical storm, which washed a good chunk of the coal overboard, as well as all the livestock that they had penned up on the decks as well. Um, but they were, they, they, and they would offer, they would basically suck a collier dry, then send it off to try and get more coal from a neutral port on the off chance, but fully expecting that they would never come back. But they managed to um, get enough coal to get most of the way across the Pacific without resupplying. Uh, interesting, interesting. Um, so... The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode where I'd like to tell you a story. I think uh, a lot of a lot of history kind of focuses on the journey uh, of some of these cruisers, especially the Von Space Squadron. But like their purpose was commerce rating. So, you know, what what was kind of their record of success when it comes to commerce rating? I know that the Emden in the Indian Ocean was maybe the most successful. Yeah, Emden Emden was prolific. Um, I forget the number. I want to say twenty two to twenty four ships off the top of my head. Um, she was really they. Um, they were really quite fortunate as well. They um, they also sank two. I think that includes two warships that they sank. Um, they because they 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 had some quite happy spells where they managed to catch like three four ships in a cut handful of days. So um, the other um, cruiser that was really successful was the Karlsruhe, who had a, a very similar number to um, Emden. But her career is less talked about because it's le- they were less 
gung ho. I mean, von Muller would just like sailed into Madras Harbor and started shelling and Dang Harbor and sank a Russian cruiser. Um, with the Karlsruhe, it had more of a gradual um, approach because it was in much more dangerous waters. So they would put uh, a collier on either side and drift up the trade spine with the idea that the colliers would um, up the uh, field of vision so they'd be able to see further. And um, they just listened to the wireless chatter. And um, the, the career was really quite successful. Um, but they uh, came to an unfortunate end. They had a, a, an explo- They exploded, uh, possibly due to an ammunition storage. Poss- no, no one's quite sure. They were uh, sailing up the Caribbean to cause trouble there, and she just blew up and took um, two-thirds of the crew down with her. But um, they, they, that was also quite a successful one. Um, the Leipzig off the western coast of America um, was less successful. She only sank two ships, but her mere presence was enough to cause massive panic in Canada. They thought there was going to be an invasion um, because the Canadian Navy, Navy only had these um, the very old HMCS Rainbow to stop her, which didn't have proper ammunition the first time it put to sea. Um, and a lot of British shipping, British flag shipping, was didn't want to go to sea where they could get caught by a German cruiser. And so it actually froze trade between uh, San Francisco and Vancouver, um, which ended up with all the docks filling up with wood and um, food stuff that wasn't, wasn't being moved. Um, the Dresden was also similarly less, um, less prolific, but they, um, they, they, had to fl- they were fleeing from the Royal Navy, so they, they kind of went down the coast of South America, set up the hidden base at Trinada, and then... Uh, went around to join Von Space Squadron. I guess just the mere existence of these ships was a, could be powerful, even if they were actually not capturing or sinking very many enemy merchant vessels. Absolutely. I mean, the Königsberg, I've just remembered the Königsberg um, caused, I mean, this, this is technically a, a treason in this country. Um, the, they captured the city of Winchester, um, which was coming from uh, India to um, through the Red Sea. And it was carrying the first of the tea harvest. So they sank this ship with all the tea, tea leaves on it. The British Admiralty then said, well, the Red Sea's got a German cruiser in it. There's no, no civilian traffic can go through the Red Sea, which then stopped tea delivery to England, <laughs> um, which is oh, that's awful. Uh, the, so the, the first of the tea, harvest, the tea harvest was late coming to London in 1914, just because one cruiser sank one ship. That's that's really interesting. I, I was just the other day I was reading a really interesting article about uh, in the Second World War. So so you know a little bit later, all the things that were done to try and make sure that stuff like tea was still available because it was so important to civilian morale uh, during the conflict. Oh, absolutely. It's um. It's I, I had a crisis the other day. I ran out of tea here. I'm like, oh god, what am I going to do? <laughs> I imagine how the nation would have felt. <laughs> um. And uh, so, so one of the things I think is, is really hard to kind of picture is that, you know, these ships are just out there and really dependent on like random wireless signals and stuff, or they just kind of hanging out in sort of mostly known ship routes, hoping to find something. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they, um, they knew where a lot of the, the trade spines would meet and um, they were, they set up, um, areas where they could go and um, recall, um, had like secret supply bases set up nearby where they could just sort of um, take the ships they've caught and move them there. Um, with the Karlsruhe, they used to um, take, uh, if there was any, if they caught a collier, they would take it off the, off the trade spine and put it in a secret bay and then just go and ravage it over weeks, as much coal of it out as possible before sinking it. But um, they knew where all the trade spines were. But the problem was, so did the British. So it was kind of a, a cat and mouse of we'll stay here for as long as it's safe and then we'll move on because as ships start to go missing, the British will then go, well, there's something going on here. And so they'd have to they'd go up and check it. Um, the Emden had that problem where um, after a very successful run, they went to Madras, fired in Madras, and then they moved around and found up towards Ceylon and they found that the British were just keeping all the ships in, in port. So they had to come off the trade routes for a period of time and then go back to it. The same, the Leipzig as well went off South America and went to the Galapagos Islands for a week. And because she disappeared, the British um, British shipping started moving again. Um, 
but um, and with von Spey squadron, they just keep they just keep going. Uh, they ignore they because uh, von Spey doesn't he doesn't feel that um, trade uh, trade warfare like that is beneath the role of an of an imperial German admiral. It's it's basically piracy. So he 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 it's not what his ships are there for. Um, but uh, as well, <laughs> which is a bit very noble of him. Um, but again, you, you have that with the with the liners that they've rebuilt, they've uh, repurposed, like the uh, uh, Crown Prince Wilhelm and the uh, later the um, uh, Prince Eitel Friedrich. Uh, they sort of stick to uh, Prince Eitel Friedrich goes up the sailing sailing spine because they figure that none of them will have rate, um, wireless, so that um, they're a bit freer to. And it also, if a ship goes missing on the sailing route, no one will notice because they're already they already take months to get anywhere. So by the time they realise they're overdue, Prince Eitel Friedrich will have gone through. Um, you know, a, a lot of these sort of ships, they, they eventually get caught or, or they eventually get destroyed uh, one way or the other. Uh, did the Germans judge them to be a success uh, when they were kind of evaluating, um, you know, the resources spent on them and then their part in the war? No. Well, yes and no, um, because they did carry out what they, what they were supposed to. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to restart. We got yes and no, and then you were talking for a bit, <laughs> and then you came back. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, uh, yes and no, uh, because they did carry out the duties that they were supposed to. I think with the regular warships, they were more than happy that the German crews had discharged their duties. Um, von Spey's squadron had successfully defeated um, the British fleet at Coronel. Uh, the first uh, Royal Navy fleet defeat since the Napoleonic War. Um, they had put in a, a, a really good show to get as far as they did. They were butchered at the at the Falklands because the, uh, the British were up the game. Said, right, we're going to get rid of you. This is it. Game over. Um, the same with same with the um, Königsberg. She walled herself in. There was nothing she could have done, and they just sat there and waited. Um, waited in that in the Refugi uh, River, and they held down a British fleet till March. Um, with the liners, they realised that they weren't they weren't ideal for the kind of war that they'd hoped they would do. Um, the uh, uh, Crown Prince Wilhelm was told to um, put into port as soon as possible because there was just no way to resupply them anymore, and that she was just burning up loads and loads of coal. But just not affecting the shipping as much as they thought she would, um, and the, her sister ship, the Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, which had put to sea in August 1914, was very, very quickly caught by a, light, a very old light cruiser, the High Flyer, and destroyed in an afternoon because they just didn't have the armor to defend themselves. And although they had guns and they put up a really good fight, they just it, it wasn't power. They weren't strong enough to fight, fight a proper warship. And the same happened at the Battle of Trinidad with the Cap Falga. They just they, they the liners weren't designed for war, and the, the amount of coal that they consumed was just it was difficult to keep themselves going. And, and um, they found that U boats were a lot more effective at stopping uh, commerce. <laughs> okay, that's all the questions I have. Uh, thank you for joining. Cool. Thanks very much for having me. 